All right, well, we're back, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the history of psychology. Um, so let's start with today's definition of psychology, which is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Okay, that seems like it needs a little breaking down if, if you are hearing it the way I'm hearing it. What are we talking about? So first off, psychology is a science. Um, what that means when we say that a, an endeavor is a science is that we're going to answer our questions using observable facts, things that other people can see also and verify. That independent verifiability is really the critical factor in science. Um, we're going to use data to draw our conclusions. We're going to base our conclusions on um, multiple factors, not just an anecdote or a single case um, in most cases. We're going to use established research methods. We're going to follow the normal protocol that sci scientists in all sorts of fields follow. So that's what we mean by being the scientific study of behavior. Now you might be thinking to yourself, I know what behavior is. Thanks for really belaboring this point. Um, but it's really important with humans and animals to talk about what we exactly mean by observable actions. These would be things that we could directly see there's no interpretation or guessing about what the obser observation is. It really is what it appears to be. So I've got a picture of a whale breaching. All you could say about that is that the whale left the water and then landed back down on it. We don't know why. We don't know how the whale feels about it. We don't know any of that stuff. All we can say is that when a whale breaches, you know, part of its body comes out of the water and then it lands on the water. Um, here we have a child standing in the corner, and you know, just from this picture, all we can really say is that the child standing in the corner, um, mouth wide open, you know, teeth bared, and hands and fists. Now, you might be drawing inferences from that picture and assuming that the child is being punished and that the child is angry about it. You might draw those inferences, but that's not an observable action. All we can say is what we're directly seeing. Um, so now let's go to the picture below that where you've got a, uh, what appears to be a man nuzzling what appears to be a woman and uh, there's a rose in the foreground. Um, we could say that the, the woman's lips are drawn back and teeth are showing in what appears to be a pleased look, right? There's like, we could be very specific about what we're seeing. Now you might be drawing an inference um, that the man is kissing the woman, but really you don't see pursed lips or anything like that. You might infer that they're romantic, right? I would infer that also, but that's not really in the picture. It's not really an action. That's an inference. Um, the guy to the left of him seems to be laughing, right? We definitely have that smile again. And, and it looks like a genuine smile, what's called a Duchesne smile, where you know the eyes are crinkled and it just looks like the person's actually laughing. Uh, but we can't draw any inferences beyond that. The, the, the person appears to be um, smiling, but we don't know why or, you know, what prompted it. We don't know what's going on. The picture to the left of that is um, the person holding their hand up to, the, to their ear. I'm using that as an example of, um, you know, a person collecting information through one of their sensory organs, in this case, ears. We would know that they collected it because they'd probably be able to produce a behavior such as repeating what they heard or nodding their head or something, you know, you've taken a hearing test where you have to put your finger up every time you hear it. Um, you could give some kind of indicator behaviorally that you collected the information. So that's what I was trying to convey with that picture. And then we have a baby sleeping at the bottom. And what I meant with that picture was to illustrate, we know that people lay down, close their eyes and are um, to different, differing degrees throughout the night unresponsive to stimulation around them. We call that sleep. We can't really draw too many inferences about what's going on during sleep, though, when we're studying behavior. All we can say is, you know, you were laying down, maybe your fingers were twitching and your toes were twitching. You know, we could say stuff like that. We can't really say what's going on inside the head of the sleeper uh, because that's not a directly observable behavior. Mental processes are all those things that you're drawing inferences about. Those are things that in, uh, mental processes are things that we can't directly see, but we can draw inferences based on your behavior. Um, so these were harder to find pictures of because these are not directly observable behaviors. Um, personality would be a good example of a mental process. It's something that happens inside the person. We might be able to infer it from their behaviors. On um, the fact and falsehood quiz, I mentioned introverts versus extroverts. 
we could infer that a person is an introvert or an extrovert based on their reactions to loud music or their preference for attending parties, things like that. We could infer what kind of personality they have, but we can't directly see their personality. Um, the person to the right of the personality, she's um, supposed to be representing thinking. Uh, it's hard to get a picture of thinking because what's thinking? It's something that happens inside of our heads. And so we can infer that a person's thinking because, for example, they don't appear to be doing anything, but they didn't really hear us when we said their name and they acted a little distracted and said, oh, what, were you talking to me? We might infer they must have been deep in thought because they didn't even hear stuff going on around them, um, yet they were awake and conscious and stuff. Love is something that has to be inferred. Happiness has to be inferred. So I tried to get some things that were kind of analogous to the pictures that are are depicted in the behavior pictures. Um, on the bottom row, the left-hand one, I was hoping to convey depression or some kind of psychological disorder. We can't directly see psychological disorders. We have to infer them from the behaviors that the person emits and we directly observe or from the symptoms that the person themselves report. So um, it's a, sometimes frustrating to people that different psychologists will give them different diagnoses. You know, one of my psychologists told me I was bipolar and one of my psychologists told me I had schizotypal personality disorder and, you know, different diagnoses. How are you all getting it so wrong? Um, we're having to infer it from what you're saying, right? So it's, um, it's kind of tricky. The last picture in my chart is uh, somebody taking a test and that is supposed to represent memory. We can't directly see memories, but we study it through the, the output that the person might, produces, you know, behaviorally. We can ask you to do something with a list of words, and then we can ask you to write down as many of the words as you can remember. And whatever words you wrote down, we're going to assume were stored in memory. The other ones seem to have been lost. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I mean by inferring, right? We have to guess or if, infer that it must have happened based on your behavior. Now, I just made a comment that might have led you to believe I'm a clinical psychologist. And it's a good time to mention I'm not a clinical psychologist. So um, when I discuss clinical things, it's um, all uh, book learning. It's not from my clinical experience. I'm a cognitive psychologist, which means I do research on things like memory and decision making and things like that. So where did psychology come from? It, it is directly out of philosophy. In fact, so directly out of philosophy that when people started studying in university level classes, questions that we now identify as psychology questions, they were getting PhDs, you know, doctors of philosophy in philosophy. Today's psychologists largely get PhDs also, but now they're PhDs in, in psychology. So uh, we directly, directly came out of philosophy and we, we still ask a lot of the same questions that ancient philosophers have asked. Uh, so let's just address a few. I could go on and on about all the different philosophers, and all the different things that they've said, but I'll save that for you to, to learn in your uh, history of, of psychology class that you would take if you're a psychology major. I just want to try and make the point, for those of you who are taking this as a breadth course or something, um, that things that have been discussed for thousands of years are things that we are still trying to get a good grasp on in psychology. So for example, Plato, 2500 BC, was talking about whether knowledge is innate. He was what's called a nativist. He really believed that you were born knowing all the things that humans can know. He was a radical nativist. He thought that you were born knowing everything and that you forgot it by the time you learned to talk, and that the function of education was to remind you of the things you already know. So uh, not only math or, or history knowledge would be part of what he's talking about, but he's also talking about personality, intelligence, and other characteristics. He thought that those were all completely innate. You were born like that. Um, now, where he thought he, those things came from is unclear. It just was the way you were made. Maybe he thought God made you like that or something like that. Modern day, we would use words like genes, right? That you inherited these traits. Aristotle, on the other hand, he followed a principle called philosophical empiricism, which meant that 
he thought you were born a blank slate, basically, and that you had to collect all information and completely become yourself as a function of experience, that you could have become anything at birth, and that it was solely through experience that you ended up the way that you are. Had you had different experiences, you would have turned out a different way, according to Aristotle. A more modern philosopher would be Rene Descartes, and I thought I'd throw him in because of his arguments on um, whether your mind and your body are one thing. He thought, no, they're two separate things. He thought that your mind is a separate entity. Some people would call it your soul. And then your body is just your earthly vessel. And when your body dies, your soul goes on to another life or to uh, heaven or something like that. So he, uh, he was what we call a dualist. The opposite side from, from Descartes, and it's kind of hard to pin down any philosophers who took the monist perspective very easily, like they're very obscure. So I'll just tell you, monists are um, philosophers who think that your mind and body are one. And so when your body dies, your mind goes with it. It's done. Um, I think you can see a lot of psychological questions just in these examples, right? We, the Plato versus Aristotle, that's nature versus nurture debate. We're trying to figure that out. Um, what we've, we've basically come to the conclusion that virtually every single psychological concept that we can think of is at least partly innate, partly nature, and partly nurture. And our jobs right now is to try and figure out what proportion of your characteristic, whatever characteristic we're talking about, let's, let's use intelligence. What proportion of your intelligence is a function of your genes and what, func what portion of it is a function of your um, experiences in the world? So we're, we are actively working on that question, the nature-nurture question. Uh, another question that we... Um, discuss is the dualism versus monism question. Are our mind and body the same thing or are they separate? And we're going to talk about those things a little bit more when we get to states of consciousness. So psychology came out of philosophy, but it also came out of physiology. Uh, physiology, um, we can go back as far as the 1600s when uh, doctors medical doctors were trying to understand the relationship of the brain and our behaviors. To what extent does our brain drive us to behave the way that we do? Um, we mostly think completely now, we mostly think that you know your brain drives your behavior, but then you guys also are aware that, for example, things outside of our brain like hormones can drive our behavior. That you might have been reading recently that, that the uh, the biome of, of your gut, you know, your intestines and stomach and stuff can affect your behavior. So you may be aware that, that things outside your brain also drive your behaviors. So we're not 100% saying that brain drives all behaviors, but I think we can all agree mostly. By the 1700s, doctors had started to figure out certain, certain areas of the brain that govern certain bodily functions. Now, this isn't as complex as behaviors per se, but they were starting to figure out what part of your brain processed vision, what part of your brain processed hearing, um, what part of your brain governed heart rate, things like that. So they were really starting to narrow it down by the 1700s. And by the 1800s, oh, no, we got a little unscientific about it. This new field called phrenology came on the scene. And it was a very pseudoscientific field. But it was asking some questions that psychologists are still trying to figure out the correct answer to. Um, if you look, if you zoom in on that uh, phrenological map that is in that picture on the right-hand side, you see that there are regions of your head that the phrenologist thought uh, that region of the brain probably drives the behavior that are relevant that is relevant to that. Um, that characteristic. So, for example, he, um, phrenology thought that your temple was where musical ability was housed because the founder of phrenology, Franz Gall, had seen uh, paintings of Mozart, and he always seemed to be tapping his, you know, had his index finger touching his temple. So Gall said, well, maybe he's activating his music center, or maybe that's how he holds his head up while he's getting his painting done. <laughs> I mean, it's 
um, you can see why this is considered a pseudoscientific field because he was asking, he was drawing inferences from incidental observations, not deliberate observations. Well, he developed a whole theory that said that these different parts of your skull would be would have bumps if you had a lot of the trait that is you know hosted by the brain underneath that bump. So he would have these uh, readings of people's brains, or skulls, sorry, where he would use his fingers and feel for bumps on their skulls and then give them a reading indicating what kind of characteristics they have, what talents they have, what shortcomings they have um, as a result of where the bumps are on their heads. Um, by the end of the 1800s, there was a machine that was developed that would uh, su supposedly very precisely find all the bumps on your skull, and then you get this printout that would tell you what kinds of characteristics you had. It wasn't much different than palm reading. I mean, it really wasn't. There's nothing to phrenology. There's no evidence that a big area of the brain would cause a bump on the skull. Uh, the, the whole thing's faulty. But it got people thinking about things like, are certain characteristics, you know, behavioral characteristics, housed in certain areas of our brain? Um, mostly no. But there are areas of the brain that we know we're starting to get better and better ideas about the function, and we'll talk about that more when we get to chapter two. And so we can thank phrenology for at least asking the question. So psychology is founded. Uh, the first psychologist is probably not somebody you've ever heard of before. You might have thought it was Sigmund Freud. A lot of people do. Everybody knows Sigmund Freud. He was not the founder of psychology. Uh, Wilhelm Wundt was the founder of psychology. At least he's given credit for it. There's a, a debate whether it was him or um, some people say that it was uh, Helmholtz, but we'll just go with Wundt. Okay, sorry, I just gave my nod to Hel Helmholtz. He's credited with founding psychology for a couple of reasons. One is that he used scientific methods. He was the first um, person to attempt to use the scientific method to study psychological processes. Now, I don't know how much you're going to like his scientific method. Um, I'll describe that next. But it, it was the first attempt to be rigorous and consistent. He wrote the first psychology text in 1874. Compared to the text that you have, it would look like a pamphlet. <laughs> I mean, what could he have to say, right? He was mostly describing uh, the one chapter we have in our textbook called Sensation and Perception. That was pre predominantly what he was describing. He opened the first lab that was devoted to the study of psychological questions in 1879 at the University of Leipzig. Um, so very early on, but also kind of late. I mean, if you think about other sciences, they've been around for a lot longer than psychology has been. And so the fact that we've only been around for, what would it be now, 140 years, we might be coming up on 150, um, kind of explains why we're having so much difficulty having solid answers to questions. We have a lot of theories, a lot of models, explanations, but we don't have you know, what, what you would call a paradigm that overrides our field, and that's partly because it's such a new field. Okay, let me tell you the technique that Wundt used for collecting data and see if you think it's very scientific. He uh, would tr he trained a bunch of graduate students. Um, altogether, about 500 people got trained by Wundt to do a technique called introspection, where they looked inside of themselves and tried to explain their experience. You know, you might have heard people in the, in the real world described as introspective. And usually what we're referring to with that is that this person is very aware of their internal states. They know what motivates them, stuff like that. So he tried to train people to be good introspectors. And then he would give them experiences. Like, for example, my favorite was when he would one by one put the participants into a dark room. And they're just sitting there waiting for something to happen. And the thing that happened was he would jab them with a pin. And then he'd ask them, describe your experience. What are you feeling? And he would expect them to describe everything, you know, ranging from pain to anger to confusion to all the things that they might be experiencing. 
if you've ever seen a person be interviewed on TV about a tragic event, they so often say, I don't have words to describe what I'm experiencing, right? It's a tough thing to ask people to look inside themselves and explain what they're experiencing, even when it's something very acute and very relevant to them. Um, so a lot of people criticize Wundt's technique of using introspection and welcomed the changes that came in the next phase um, where we attempted to maybe do more observable um, you know, measurements. So early schools of psychology. Edward Titchener was one of um, Wundt's students, and he actually gave a name to what Wundt had been studying. He called it structuralism. Really what Wundt was interested in was trying to figure out what makes up your conscious experiences, the things that you're aware of, what factors go into that awareness. So he was really trying to figure out the structures that support your conscious awareness. And so Titchener um, is credited with coming up with a name for that. Now, another of Blunt's students was William James. He was an American. Um, Blunt and Titchener were both German, and they both stayed in Germany. Um, James was an American who went and studied with Blunt, and you know, there really were, were no places to study psychology in the US. So to figure out this new field, uh, James went and spent many years working with Bund and came back to the United States and established the first psychology lab. He also wrote the first American psychology text, um, which, of which I happen to have a copy I'm very proud of. But um, he founded a school of thought called functionalism. So whereas Wundt had been interested in the structures that support consciousness, um, James was interested in why you have different conscious capabilities. You know, what's the function? How do, how do these things help us to live and adapt in our environment? So he was very interested in why we have memory, why we have language. You know, what do these things do for us? So he had a very uh, evolutionary attitude about the, the function of, of different skill sets and things like that. And you could tell that, that James was affected by Darwin, who had written on the origin of species in 1880-ish. And so James had clearly read that, and he thought, why can't we explain human mental um, you know, processes through those, that lens? OK, here's um, Freud, who was not the founder of psychology. <laughs> He was actually the founder of psychiatry. I don't know if he's even credited as the founder of psychiatry, frankly. He was definitely the founder of psychoanalysis. Um, he was a medical doctor, and a lot of you may have heard stories about Sigmund Freud and what he was up to in medical school. But uh, as a medical doctor, he thought that psychological disorders were going to always have biological bases. Um, whether they came through the genes, I don't think he argued that. He argued more like there was something physically going wrong. He thought environmental factors could trigger those things to go wrong. Uh, what he's really famous for and what he really has had an impact on psychology for is he came up with the concept of the unconscious. Um, the idea that you have a storehouse for information that you don't want to have to think about. You can place it into an inaccessible state in your unconscious. Also, what the unconscious does is motivates us without us knowing why. So sometimes our unconscious works against our stated um, plans or our goals. He says that within our unconscious, there are conflicts that we face. And we're going to talk about this more when we get to personality theory. But he said that the two big factors that contribute to conflict in our unconscious is our sexual motivations or our sexual memories, and then our aggressive motivations or our memories of aggression. Um, and those factors working themselves out in our unconscious have big impacts for our personality, he said. All right, we'll talk about him more later. Behaviorism. We'll talk more about this later also. We have a whole chapter on this um, called learning. I think the chapter is just called learning or it's called learning theory. Behaviorism came on the scene and said, we need to stop asking people what they think. We need to stop asking people to try and give accurate representations of their experience. And instead, we need to solely focus on observable behaviors. That's it. 
And do not draw any inferences about what must have been going on inside the head. Only look at the observable behavior. They thought, behaviorists thought, that behavior is always due to either an association between external events, things that, two things that happen out in the environment, one starts to become a predictor for us. And we start to think, okay, I saw one thing happen. I know the other one's likely to happen soon. So those kinds of associations between external events or uh, an association between our behavior and its consequences, rewards and punishments. Pavlov was the one who developed the idea that we can make associations between external events. And in fact, he initially discovered that with dogs. You probably are familiar with Pavlov's dogs. You ring a bell and they'll drool, right? Um, so he really found, discovered classical conditioning in animals, and he spent years studying that question and how associations are formed. John Watson, here in the U.S., Pavlov was Russian, by the way. John Watson, um, here in the U.S., he took Pavlov's classical conditioning ideas and applied it to humans. So he was the one who made that leap between trying to, you know, condition drools and eye blinks and things like that in animals and trying, um, and instead started trying to condition fear and other kinds of, you know, very basic responses in humans. And then B.F. Skinner is the one who really studied rewards and punishments. He founded a field called operant conditioning, and he was really interested in how we can shape a person's behaviors based on the consequences that follow the previous behavior. So if you have a rat that pushes the lever and they get a food pellet, does that increase the likelihood that they'll push the lever? Um, if they push the lever and, the, and their feet get shocked, does it reduce the likelihood that they'll press the lever? So we'll talk about all of these guys in a lot more detail when we get to the chapter on learning. The thing about behaviorism is that it really was in charge for about 50 years in psychology. During that period, humanistic psychology tried to get traction. It tried to get some attention. Um, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow are the most famous of our humanistic psychologists. Uh, there are others. I'm, I'm giving you the big names in all the fields, just so that you'll kind of know who people are. But humanistic psychology was really interested in the positive potential of humans. This field was a reaction to Freud saying that we're only motivated by sex and aggression. It was a reaction to the behaviorists who said that we're only, you know, passively responding to the things that are happening to us in our environment. Uh, humanists really believe that what makes humans special is that we're basically good, that we want to be our best selves, um, that we have self-determination, we have free will, that, you know, it's important for us to have choices so that we feel autonomous and, you know, as, like we're free beings. So those are really important things for healthy development in humans. So these were really a reaction to, you know, Freud and his negative implications. And then, you know, behaviorism, e emphasizing so much external influences and ignoring the fact that the, that the person can make choices. The person can make their own decisions. So this little fledging, fledgling field got started in the 1940s, but it was really difficult with behaviorism sort of running all of psychology for humanism to make much uh, impact until about the 1960s. So while it was founded during the, the 1940s, it really started to gain traction in the 70s. Now, more recent fields, uh, cognitive psychology is, is thought to be one of the bigger fields in um, psychology right now. I can't say that it's the dominant field like behaviorism was from 1920 to 1970. Cognitive psychology is sort of the de facto sort of assumed perspective for almost every field in psychology, though. Um, everything drills down to, to cognitive psychology in some way, right? Because cognitive psychology studies perception, like how do we make sense of the information coming in through our sense organs? You know, thinking is studied by cognitive psychology and memory and reasoning and you know, sort of a lot of things that you think of as psychology are really cognitive psychology. The thing that makes cognitive psychology so different from behaviorism is that we've sort of gone full circle back to the kinds of questions that Wundt and Titchener and James were asking, but now we're using directly observable methods. 
So it's a return to the emphasis on mental processes, but now we're using different techniques to allow us to draw conclusions. So we have fields like cognitive neuroscience, where we're asking cognitive questions and we're using neuroscience to figure out the answers. Um, so cognitive psychology is sort of the new school, um, the most dominant, but it's not the only school right now. You know, in the olden days of psychology, we went sort of from structuralism to functionalism to behaviorism with these little bits of psychoanalysis and humanism kind of in the background during the behaviorism period. So now we have all sorts of different ways of looking at psychological questions. So I've been talking for a while, so I'm going to take a little break and we'll come back and we'll talk about different ways of interpreting psychological phenomena.